My name is Liz Ryerson. Uh, I am a, a game designer, a composer of music, a visual artist, and critic. Um, I did the music for Dysphoria, which you might have played. Um, I did a game called Problematic. I write stuff about games on my blog. And um, yeah, I have some art, actually, that is going to be sold at the Wild Rumpus party tonight. Anyway. Um, this talk uh, is about kind of conveying ideas through abstraction, so let's get started. This, by the way, is a screenshot from uh, an Atari 800 game. It's like a sort of a homebrew Polish game, in case you're wondering. So the history of video games is kind of a history of expression defined by technological limitations. In hindsight, it's easy to look back fondly on the old days of games and forget all the mind-numbing efforts that went into even making these games run. Back then, games were constantly engaged in a struggle to make any sort of basic sense of the language of game design and try to make it look or feel like something kind of tangible and interesting within the strict limitations that were imposed on them. And I think a lot of like older games carry this very strongly, for better or for worse. Um, now, of course, we choose the limits. Oh, sorry. Um, and um, we can do pretty much whatever we want within, you know, our own limitations um, and, you know, the, what kind of context we're working in. But I, I think there's a thing where uh, we sort of see this, like, this gaminess, this kind of uh, ex expression defined by these, the limits of this technology as kind of a prison that we need to escape from like as something that needs to be kind of uh, transcended in order to like realize our ideas or for, in order for games to be taken more seriously. Um, games like, like Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, whatever, we think of these games as approaching a kind of like representational realism or, or kind of like a documentary realism or as speaking, at, at the very least, speaking to our reality in some more kind of real or tangible way, even if, you know, we don't like them or whatever. Um, but we forget that there are like thousands and thousands and really millions of tiny little details from many different sources that go into the constructions of building these realities. Um, in actuality, game worlds in like Call of Duty or GTA are really no less abstract in some ways than, than Mario or Tetris. They're just way, way more detailed and convincing sort of facsimiles of something kind of more resembling our own reality. Um, Okay. A lot of the ideas uh, that we see in games are not really new. Instead, they're sort of retellings of retellings of retellings. Um, you know, maybe this screen, this area in like a Call of du in the newest Call of Duty game was inspired by like the original Alien film or like a Superman comic or like maybe it's cribbed from other games like Bioshock or Half Life or something like that. Um, and I think increasingly games have been so reflective of themselves that they've stopped being able to kind of acknowledge how constructed the worlds in them are. Because we've seen an idea or a gameplay concept so many times before we start to see it kind of as being part of our reality. Um, and then as a culture, we're kind of unable to accept that these are abstractions because when you see these kind of images uh, saturated everywhere around you, it's easy to feel like they're current and relevant and kind of speak to you in some way. And that's kind of the scary thing. When you put something out into the world, it can affect other people in a really powerful way that you probably never even considered. And people start to internalize it, and it becomes part of the way that we construct like the reality around us outside of a game. And I think games do this in a really, really powerful way. But the kind of weird paradox here is um, that while game worlds are like feel increasingly real and sort of powerful, almost hyper-real, uh, there's still kind of like an undeniable fakeness to it, like, you know, the uncanny valley, that kind of stuff. Um, and it d doesn't ever really go away. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think this is actually really a bad thing at all. I think, like, contrary to popular belief, um, their fakeness provides us a different way of, like, looking at our reality and looking at ourselves and uh, realizing ideas or feelings that we can't fully experience in our own reality through the language of this machine. We just have to understand that it's a machine and, and this is the language that it's speaking in and it is not our own reality. Um, and, you know, games can put us um, 
uh, outsiders kind of might fear games because they're kind of an unknown or they put people into this like trance-like state. Um, but, you know, it can just as easily be kind of a dreaming or meditative or contemplative or playful state as, as kind of like a violent, violent angry, control-obsessed one that like the cliched image of video games is. Okay. So the disclaimer is this talk is not about how to kind of realize more abstract design ideas through AAA. I don't have experience with that. I'm here to tell you about kind of smaller, more independent things that, and talk about ideas that you might not have realized, but I can't help with that. <laughs> um, I think this is more intended to be inspirational and, um, and kind of communicating with fellow game designers or people thinking about games or just curious and want to be introduced to new things. Um, I'm also, you know, this is like, I'm not going to be up, get up here and like shit talk AAA because I don't have time to and it's not really worth it. <laughs> like, you all are probably intimately familiar with all the problems of AAA, so I don't really need to, to talk about that. Um, so this is a game, sorry, the, the screenshot is quite big, so it takes up the... This game's called Strange Climbing by Strange Think. Um, he actually has a game downstairs at the Mild Rumpus, kind of like an art gallery game. Um, but I, I like this game because it's kind of a procedural first-person climber where your goal is just to make it to the top of this like weird structure. Um, and it's, it's generated, obviously. Um, but I find it interesting how the mechanics of the, the game are so integrated into the actual structure itself. Like, um, the geometry kind of serves both uh, an aesthetic purpose of just being like this weird structure and kind of like the, the mood of that is like a very distinctive thing. And also like a gameplay purpose where all those kind of jagged edges are like things that you have to interact with and potentially like assess whether you're able to jump further up. And um, I actually really, I really like this game because it's very simple but it's very challenging at the same time. And it's all just doing it within this like one little structure and the jump key. Um, in a way, I think it's kind of applying the same principle. Um, I, used, I saw this when I was in uh, film class, um, this uh, documentary about uh, this architect, Louis Kahn, who sort of wanted his buildings to not hide their raw materials. This is a big kind of... Uh, if you saw Robert Yang's talk about level design yesterday, he sort of talks about this, um, you know, uh, philosophy of... of uh, more modern architecture is buildings not hiding their materials and stuff like that. Um, and I think, I think that game by Strange Think is very similar in that it's completely uh, computer generated and unreal, but it's still like beautiful in a way, even though you know you can see that it's not like a real structure. It's, it's not hiding the sort of algorithms and whatever that created it in the structure. It's kind of embracing it. Um, so I don't think that like you know not hiding your parts means like like a lack of polish, and that's one thing that I want to talk about. Like you know, it was a concern when I submitted my talk that that, that I should talk about this. Like I think that polish is kind of a, a loaded term, or at least a kind of a construction in a lot of game circles, because we, we kind of do have, you know, established standards of what polish means that have come out of, like, industry practices, you know, what it means kind of visually and sound-wise in terms of, like, the design and, you know, what is kind of accessible, what it communicates clearly, what it means to communicate, and uh, usually, or at least often, it's equated to kind of like a level of detail or a level of like this looks like it's actually, you know, something kind of that was like designed and intentionally made. Um, and, um, or, or it can just mean like more shiny and commercial looking. Um, but I, I think these, the point is the constructions are kind of, def this is a construction kind of defined by the culture of games. And it doesn't really necessarily speak to how well the content of the games is conveyed or tell you, you know, about what's inside the game. The, in fact, there really is kind of no approach that's necessarily better for, you know, a work across the board. It completely is dependent on what you're kind of trying to express. And there are a lot of kind of range of emotions and ideas that aren't expressed through this kind of triple A idea or even like a more commercial indie idea of what polish means. 
And I, I think if you look at something like Polish in kind of a more progressive light, uh, and you look at it as being a reflection of how well a game realizes its ideas, it's more subjective, but it's not arbitrary. Like, there is definitely a difference between things that are kind of like one-off experiments and things that effectively kind of use uh, a, a particular style or idea to realize their ideas, and we're going to look at some of those. Uh, so this is a game. It looks like a YouTube window, but it's actually a game uh, by Stephen Lavelle, a.k.a. Inkrupara, who is probably the most interesting, no, without a doubt, I, in my opinion, the most interesting game designer who's working today. Um, and I'd say this game is very polished. Uh, it was for, like, a Ludum Dara, but, like, essentially you open it up and it's like uh, this YouTube window and you're actually playing the game that's inside the window, but it's a finite length, that like 210 that it's saying, you know, that's as long as the game is. And uh, there's a narration over top with this guy, like boring narration, this guy is talking about, yeah, this game is okay, I guess. And, <laughs> and, like, and then like random like gay porn windows pop up and you have to like click them out. And then like people like try to message you on Messenger and you're trying to like click that out while you're controlling the thing. And sometimes the cat just jumps on the dude's keyboard and like screws you up just like, and you, you die. Um, and like, so, so this game is only two minutes long. It's kind of a, a joke game, but uh, the way that it's presented is really like really effective because you open it up and it's like, what? Why? Why am I in a YouTube window? Like, what is this? It has this purpose. The presentation has this purpose of sort of defamiliarizing you with your kind of relationship with games, and uh, you know, putting it in a different context. And I think it. For this purpose, it's like a joke. It's not really trying to communicate something narrative-wise, but um, it does it really, really effectively and really powerfully, which is why I think it's a really interesting game. Uh, so there's this other game by him that you know looks, again, completely different. Let's see if I can uh, open it up in... Okay, that's another game. Let's see if I can open it up in a window here. Um, it's called uh, The Terrible Whiteness of Appalachian Nights. Um, and I'm not going to play very far into it, but um, it has this sort of ASCII art style, um, and uh, it's incredibly disturbing, as you can probably tell. Um, it uses this kind of weird, like, uh, kind of old computer monitor kind of font to to make to kind of. Uh, you know, give a, off a, a particular feeling of like weirdness and disorientation that's like really well reflected by the audio. And I think the audio really does like the strongest work in this game. But okay, I'm gonna skip all this. Um, essentially, all you do in this game is wander around and you're this like ASCII character, and this this crazy, weird, frantic music plays in the background. Um, and you're this like housewife who's aimlessly wandering around her house, kind of periodically checking up on members of her family. And uh, basically all she does is sleep, um, and most of it you're just kind of wandering around frantically, um, just like checking on your family members. And uh, I don't know, the, the, the music and stuff is just like, there's almost kind of like a dissociative uh, approach to the, like the visuals is almost like kind of reflecting the dissociation of the character, um, that there's something like really disturbing sort of going on under the surface and that everything kind of in her life has been abstracted to these symbols uh, that she just doesn't know how to control or, or do anything with anymore. And this all kind of uh, builds up to like a really bizarre, like not safe for work moment at the end that I don't really know what it means, but kind of reflects the mood of the game. And I, so I, I guess the point that I wanted to get across here is that this game uses that kind of style to um, you know, that we associate with, like, very kind of older games that, you know, don't have that, um, didn't have the graphical capability to, to realize much, and it embraces it as kind of a reflection of the narrative themes of the game. Um, and a, a, another game sort of indirect contrast by him is called Slave of God. I'll show you a, a video here. You're, it's like a really bizarre game where you're in a dance club, and you're just, like, wandering around and dancing with people. Essentially, it looks like um, like being on drugs, um, but like you know, when people say like, "Oh, this looks like being on drugs," no, this game like literally looks like being on drugs. <laughs> it like has this all these like bizarre shader effects, but um, it like kind of 
captures this feeling way more directly and sort of powerfully than other any other games that I've seen that sort of, oh, goodness. Well, you get the idea, anyway. <laughs> um, and um, I don't know. It, it, it's really effective in a kind of a way that's hard to convey. Um, but the, the point is that these games, were all, while they're all very different, uh, kind of really effectively convey what they're setting out to capture. Um, and they use all the tools of games to do this. They use the visuals, they use the design, they use the interface, they use the audio, as you've seen, like, which is a really overlooked component, by the way, as someone who's like a, a composer and sound designer of like conveying sort of narrative um, I, or ideas um, that you want to convey in a game. Um, and I think uh, this is why I find his work really interesting. It's all completely based on what idea he's trying to realize, and the visuals and everything are kind of uh, just all in service to whatever idea he's trying to realize. And that's why I think he's like probably the most interesting game designer working in games right now. So this is a, another designer who's a little less well known. He's uh, it's called his name is Pedro Paiva. Um, I think that's how you pronounce it. He's Brazilian, um, and this this game's called Caro Cracia. And like literally, uh, it's even it runs even faster than this. This just animated GIF is slowed down because uh, you know I blew it up and everything. But um, it's a short game, and basically all all you can do is like you can't cross the road because there's too many cars. Like. And uh, you're just like your character's frowning, and then you go into like the car god like um, garage here, and then they just tell you you don't have a car, so you can't do anything. And like, <laughs> and that's all it is. It's like this really like weird sarcastic commentary about cars and like why you need a car for everything, and like it it just conveys it in this kind of like weird like bootleg game looking style where um, you know it just seems like this kind of like weird amateurish thing, but it reflects kind of the, the weird tone of the game and um, the kind of anarchic sort of ideas that he is trying to get across. His games are almost kind of like, I, I describe as being like anti-games. So if I can get this to run, this is another game of his. It's like a compilation of, it seems like some kind of comp compilation of arcade games. This, called, this one's called Mel Gibson, the Hedgehog. See, <laughs> I, I don't speak Spanish, but... Um, you open the game and it does this. Sometimes it just randomly crashes. I don't know. Uh, um, but these are all like broken arcade games, basically. And this is like, as you can tell, this is, um, I don't know if you guys are Sonic fans, but this is the Green Hill Zone music. <laughs> oh no, I died. Um, and here's, a, here's another game that I like a lot. Um, yeah, and every game does this when you when you hit start, and sometimes it just crashes. Um, and you're like like this little frenzy thing running around. I don't know actually what the goal in this game is. Um, well, most of the other ones have goals, but I, I like what happens when you die. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's called VHS Maluco, um, and it's sort of a compilation of like really like weird anti-game like sarcastic takes on um old arcade games and and the game is like the games are hardly playable but there's a there's a like an undeniable sort of like artistic sensibility that runs through his games of like this kind of like anarchist like um you know uh, like idea of like the games the game mechanics are dishonest and they're kind of disingenuous and and we need to kind of destroy them or melt them and actually it's something that he talks about like called melting video games and he says um from his patreon it's uh, when i talk about melting video games i'm thinking of corroding the borders that maintains the most diverse part of people away from the inside community uh, he's not a native English speaker, so. <laughs> um, uh, and the inside people stuck in. I love video games, but I hate the mainstream culture around it. Um, and I think, like, uh, the, the, you know, the, the reaction that a lot of people would have is, oh, these games look amateurish. But, like, if you play them, you realize that there's something very different about these games. Like, they are very simple, and and they are very, like, kind of, abstract and broken looking, but there's kind of a philosophy or sensibility that's reflected 
uh, in the design and in the way that it's presented. And I think that's something that we need to understand is very intentional. And it's something that is using this kind of idea of glitch or like brokenness as part of its philosophy rather than just doing it as a, a trend or whatever. So I think it's really important to make that distinction. And it's, yeah, it's not, ju it's not just done because it's easy to do. I mean, it might be easy to do, and that's a good reason to do something, but that's not the only reason to do something, or really a, the best reason to do something. Um, and so, like, abstraction uh, is not just about, like, glitch or looking weird in 8-bit. Uh, there are plenty of, like, I think horror games are really the best at kind of uh, realizing abstraction, you know, embracing abstraction and using that in kind of the game mechanics, uh, you know, reflecting what uh, they want to get across, and which is usually a feeling of, like, terror or disorientation. This game's called Nevermind. It just had a Kickstarter recently. Um, and, like, this is the main area that you are outside where there's just this, like, bizarre models of a 3D house that are, like, stacked... Uh, or, like, 3D models of a house that are just stacked up on top of each other in a really surreal way. And when you play it, it's, like, obviously intended uh, to reflect this kind of idea that the house is a terrifying place and and it's like building up on your sort of the characters or your sort of um, like anxieties about being in the house. And you see that it's a very like easy visual, visual metaphor that kind of reflects what the game is trying to get across. Something that we understand intuitively but might not necessarily be able to explain. I think like horror games do that really well. But like I said, these visuals are very quote unquote polished in the conventional sense, but it's still doing something very weird with the form that is, is different and, and abstract and not real in like the representational realism sense. Um, this is a, a shot from um, Silent Hill 4, and you have this character who's like wandering around with you in your apartment. Who's she's a pretty she's pretty nice, like, um, but she just gets kind of beaten up throughout the game, especially if you play badly. Um, and like, you know, sometimes at the end of the game, she'll just be in bandages and like just bruised all over. But th there's this room where you just sort of randomly enter into, and a huge version of her head just like stares at you, and like its eyes are sort of twitching. And it's this this really odd moment um, that isn't necessarily like explained in the plot or the the story or anything. But like, I think it kind of uh, is something that like the Silent Hill games in particular are really good at doing. Uh, reflecting this, the themes of this game, or the themes of the games in a very kind of surreal uh, way that's hard to really verbally express why it works or what it's saying, but it has this in incredibly strong impact on you when you're playing. And it's not just um, an impact of being scared, it's also like, what is this? Like, why am I experiencing this? And it kind of uh, pressures you to. Can you know think about your relationship with the game in a way that you might not normally do so? Um, well, another like uh, moment that I think about a lot is uh, in Silent Hill Two, where it's towards the end of the game. I think they do this in several Silent Hill games, but like you're in this sort of hotel, and it, your character is kind of um, without spoiling too much. Like your character's kind of psychological world is falling apart, and you know you have like very clear maps and layouts in the game. But um, in the, at this point, you, uh, it starts raining inside the hotel, which is like already like, what is this doing? And you open a door, and you go to a completely other side of the hotel in a completely different room, and all the doors just start connecting with each other in this really bizarre way, unpredictable way. And it, it's it's something that that games like it's almost arbitrary what door that you enter into where it leads you in a game, right? Like it's just any you, it's something that you can change easily. And, um, but it's using this in a way to kind of reflect uh, the mood of the game um, and, and kind of, you know, defamiliarize your relationship with the space and say that this is kind of a psychological world. This is not really a, a real world. And I think it's, it's something that games are incredibly um, good at doing. Um, so another game that's one of my favorite games called Yume Nikki. Uh, it's, it's a free uh, Japanese game, uh, RPG maker game. And it's another game sort of about dreams. Let's see if I can um, show you a video quickly. Um, and you sort of, you're this little girl. Um, 
and you wander around this kind of weird, surreal world. Let's skip ahead so that I can... Um, and you enter, from your apartment, you enter into this... Um, I don't know. Okay. You enter into this like bizarre hallway of doors, and the doors kind of send you through to these very surreal worlds, which the further the, that you go into it, um, the more kind of the less abstract they become and the more kind of reflective of something that this girl might be experiencing um, you actually see like and you're actually able to extrapolate some narrative from it. but it's a very kind of nonlinear narrative that isn't really like something that you can explicitly define but I think like this game has a huge following people have tried to just uh, kind of interpret the plot there's a lot of like discussion about it and it's all because this kind of just curiosity of exploring this game and like all the these bizarre symbols what they mean and and what your relationship with them is because it's something that's just so different from from what other games try to do because really like you have these objects that you can use to do certain things but really basically all you do is wander around and there isn't really any sort of direction that you're guided towards so that kind of allows you to have your own relationship with the game and experience it in a in a different way than something is like yeah you just got uh she just got the frog power and now she can turn into a frog (laughs) um but yeah um Let's exit out that. I think in a way, like, uh, a game like Yume Nikki is kind of a metaphor for all games because we we enter into these doors, we enter into these digital spaces not knowing what's going to come out. We know it's not real. We know it's going to, like, change us in some way and we're going to have some certain interaction with it, but it's kind of mysterious. It's almost like we're kind of... Um, injecting ourselves with something without really knowing what what is going to happen. Um, but uh, these doors, like through their kind of the weird abstract machine language and like these uh, kind of array of symbols, um, tell us something about ourselves and tell us something about the way that we experience the world. And um, I think that's tremendously beautiful and powerful. Games are in basically dreams. Um, so before I, I continue on my last thing, I just want to mention a, a few games by women because I didn't do that in this talk and I feel really bad about that. But there are some games that um, I also think that you should really check out. Um, uh, some games by Lilith, uh, who made this game called Crip Worlds, which I, I'm biased because I did like the sound effects and the music for it. But um, she has another game called, uh, what is it called? Oneric Gardens. I don't know how to Oneric Gardens. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's like this kind of anthology of different weird 3D spaces that kind of seems like like old PlayStation One games and um, kind of reinterpreting it. Um, another game that's interesting that was almost in the IGF but not quite nominated is called Curtain by Laura uh, Dreamfield. It has this really kind of bizarre lo-fi style and it's kind of more of a narrative game. That one's definitely worth, worth checking out. And also um, one of the games that's in the Nuovo this year is called Tetrageddon Games. I think those games are tremendously like really, really cool and um, kind of use this like cheesy um, 90s kind of uh, net art AOL kind of uh, old flash movie style to um, kind of get at their own aesthetic thing. So those are all worth checking out. But this is a game called Judith, which is also by Inkerpar and Terry Kavanaugh, who is somewhere at the conference. Um, And uh, it's a game that I keep coming back to because I had a real relationship with like Wolfenstein 3D when I grew up. And... um, that sort of, like, there's a sort of disturbingness to that game that's never really kind of put to the surface, but you sort of, is sort of implied at in some of the level design and some of the other things like that. And so I I kind of just, like, imagined and extrapolated based on that. I've written some articles about it that are, you know, worth checking out if you're interested in that. But the thing that I like about Judith is it takes this, like, Raycaster 3D style, you know, essentially 2D, 3D style, and uh, it, it kind of owns it and uses and, and brings that disturbingness to the surface as part of the, the narrative theme, which is about this... Um, it's, a, it's essentially about the story of Bluebeard, and it's about this woman finding out that her husband is actually this horrible guy who's doing all these horrible things. Um, and uh, there's another aspect to the narrative, but essentially, like, it's about this woman wandering around kind of experiencing things passively, 
Um, and I, I think that it's an interesting uh, kind of gender metaphor in there, uh, along with Yume Nikki, about like the ways that women are kind of taught to interact with the world through like kind of passively and ob ob observation, um, you know, r rather than this kind of traditional masculine view, um, quote unquote masculine view of how we approach games, where it's about interacting and sort of controlling and manipulating systems. But anyway, that's just something I thought about. <laughs> um, uh, with the history that we create, we sort of leave traces of the past behind. Um, ideas or styles that we might have thought were dead keep popping up again in different contexts. There is kind of an eeriness to the old that never quite go goes away. It's almost like a ghost. It's almost as if it is still calling out to us to be kind of exhumed and re-explored with all that we know now. Conventional wisdom um, in games says that the legacy of a lot of old forgotten games uh, was that they were stepping stones or they were the results of technological struggles or dead ends or sometimes even just like embarrassments. Like we want to bury them in the ground and forget about them like the E.T. The e. story, the famous story about E.T. Um, being buried in like a, a I don't know, it was like a under concrete in like Arizona. There was actually just a documentary about them digging it up. But... Um, we've sort of inevitably thrown them out for more polished or easy to play or easy to look at games. And in many ways, of course, we have improved the craft of games uh, exponentially, design-wise and gameplay-wise. A game as like singularly in industry-defining as Mario was so huge because it was a huge improvement over what came before. And like Mario 3 is a huge improvement over Mario. We, we built that language. We know it works well. We we know what feels kind of better and smoother to the player, but in other ways, I think, still think we're left wanting for something more. I know there's a lot of attitudes um, around game culture now that like to kind of assert that games, um, games are all about like Mario and Doom and Pac-Man, and that's like games culture, and that's what like gamers are, and that's, that's that, that gamer culture. But that, that whole thing is a construction. Like weird art experimental games have always existed even before Mario, and we need to realize that, like, as part of the industry, we need to realize part of the history of this medium and respect it and not just, like, you know, go with the, the Kool-Aid token narrative that, that everyone kind of just blindly accepts. Um, here are some very strange games from the 80s. This one's called Microsurgeon. Uh, it's for the Intellivision. You're kind of controlling this thing, and you're, like, shooting this bacteria. Um, it came out in 1982, which is three years before Mario. This game's called uh, Deus Ex Machina. It's a, a Spectrum game. It's one of the first like art experiment games. There's actually voiceover narration through the whole thing. It's because it was on a cassette. Like uh, ZX Spectrum had sort of a cassette player, um, and uh, yeah, it was a kind of an interesting, ambitious game. Even though it was kind of, you know, had its own problems. This game's called Go to Hell. Um, <laughs> for the ZX Spectrum. The, the, the same guy did another game called Soft and Cuddly, which is also equally weird. But this came out the same year as Mario, and it's just as bizarre as any like random weird indie game that you're going to find online. Probably even more bizarre, to be honest. Um, in spite of the, the technological limitations uh, of these games, um, like they still speak to us, and, and there's still something that makes them us able to see something about them in the present. Their unapologetic abstractness reveals something natural and intrinsic about the form of games. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I just think that it's important to realize that this kind of experimentation has always been around. Um, but I, I believe that we need to start embracing abstractness as a virtue rather than a shortcoming. If we're really interested in expanding the form of games, we should be leaving no stone unturned. And of course, that doesn't mean that all games have to look like weird 8-bit punk games or whatever. But at the very least, we can be open to the, the ideas that are in these games and respect them and take inspiration from them, even when they're broken and you know, they have design weaknesses. Games are dreams. Their gaminess, uh, quote-unquote, is a central part of this dream. It's the source of their power. It's their light. And I believe that we do ourselves a huge disservice to this medium the more that we spend trying to tame this abstractness, this gaminess, in order to build something kind of more predictable and representational and known instead of sincerely trying to explore something new and unknown that might tell us something different about ourselves and the world around us. 
Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I went a little bit over time. Um, I don't know if there's any time for questions. Okay. Okay, I do have time. If you want to ask a, a question, a few questions, uh, go up to the mic. I have and, a question. Okay. Um, that was awesome. I really liked how you made uh, game art topics very fun and approachable. And my question is, can you give us like the 30 second summary of your take on the, the Wolf 3D aesthetic? Um, what specifically? Castle Wolf. Uh, you said you had a whole thing that you wrote about the sort of like the eeriness of... Yeah. Well, so I think there's sort of a... Um, the game is about something that's like very kind of real, uh, like representational. It's about sort of like World War II, or at least ostensibly. But then there's this kind of bizarre gaminess about it uh, where you have to collect all this treasure and there's like no way that you could carry all this treasure and there are just like turkey dinners lying on the floor. And I, I think it kind of... It, it kind of toes the line between having some sort of like realistic uh, art and then having this like weird gaminess that is actually kind of disturbing and I don't know if it's intentional but it's just something that I've always kind of thought about and um, you know had like weird dreams about and, and things like that so I, I don't know that's just my personal it's like a little thing. grotesque right yeah, yeah it is a little grotesque and that can that can be like really kind of bad and that can be a good thing and I don't really know which way to take it with that game but it's I, I think it's like interesting for me to think about and look at as an illustration of other things anyway and you felt like that other game you were comparing it with yeah Judith yeah was similar in that sense or um, well it uses the same sort of like Raycaster format and it kind of but it kind of brings that disturbingness to the surface as part of the theme of the game as like the narrative but yeah, no, I, I see those two things as being related just, you know, because of the kind of style. It's the same thing with, like, uh, the game Terrible Whiteness of Appalachian Nights. Like, there are a lot of old games that sort of have that ASCII art, but this is kind of using it in a different way and reappropriating it for, for something that was al al always kind of there, but never really kind of called attention to. Awesome. Thanks a lot. No problem. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, if we compare um, game development with um, art, and if we see the uh, path that the classic uh, visual art uh, followed from some uh, primitive forms, then to mm -hmm. realism, and then to some surrealism, some abstract art, uh, do you think that uh, game development will uh, follow the same path? And now we are um, seeing that it uh, turns from some realism to some more uh, abstract forms. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think there's some, like, universal patterns, but it's also not probably going to happen in exactly the same way. But I, I also think it's kind of is happening with a lot of, like, indie games and experimental games. And it's always been around. It's just, like, it being sort of popular, popularized and understood, it might take a while because games are tremendously complicated. Like, there's a lot of things that go into kind of understanding and interacting with games, but... Uh, you know, like newer generations of people are able to kind of deal with like navigating all these like technological interfaces and stuff because they grow up with it. It's so intuitive and just like central to their part of life. So I think that the culture and literacy around games is definitely going to develop and that's going to result in kind of more weird abstract things. Um, but yeah. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Uh, I have to take it to the wrap up room. So um, I'm sorry, but I would. Thank you. If any questions, feel free to come up to me later. But I hope you have a good session or rest of your day. <laughs> come to Lost Levels, 1, a 1 p.m.